Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Cherise Trump, Associate Director of Coalition Relations at the Heritage Foundation. I'm pleased to welcome you to our event today with Latvian Prime Minister, His Excellency Christianis Karens, to speak on a transatlantic approach to economic recovery. Welcome to those joining us from our Resource Bank Network, our closest friends and allies and conservative leaders. Welcome also to members of the public. Our public programs team has a full suite of robust programming, which you can always find at heritage.org forward slash events. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. This session is being recorded and we post it on heritage.org within the next 48 hours. All attendees are also going to be in listen only mode. I am pleased to have with us for today's discussion, Ambassador Terry Miller. I invite to join me on the screen. Ambassador Miller is the director for the Center for International Trade and Economics and a fellow in economic freedom here at the Heritage Foundation. At the Center for Trade of Economics, uh, Ambassador Miller focuses on research into how free markets and international trade foster economic growth around the world. He is editor of a signature Heritage publication, the Annual Index of Economic Freedom. Before joining Heritage in 2007, Ambassador Miller had a distinguished career in the U.S. Foreign Service. In 2006, he was appointed as an ambassador to the United Nations and U.S. representative on the U.N.'s Economic and Social Council. Ambassador Miller previously served at the State Department as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic and Global Issues, and he headed offices at State devoted to the promotion of human rights, social issues, and development and trade. I will now hand it over to Ambassador Miller. Thank you, Cherise. Uh, I want to say good evening to the Prime Minister and all our friends in Riga and throughout Europe, and good morning to our audience in Washington and throughout the United States. The theme of our event today is transatlantic cooperation for economic recovery in a post-pandemic world. My colleagues at the Heritage Foundation and I recently published a paper on this topic in which we outlined a number of areas where increased partnership could speed transatlantic economic recovery. Uh, of particular relevance to this discussion are uh, things like the, the Three Seas Initiative, which links the Baltic with the Adriatic and Black Sea, uh, the possibility of a US-EU trade agreement, uh, energy security, and Europe's approach to 5G technology. All of this, of course, in the context of promoting and preserving our free market economic systems. Uh, that last point is dear to me, um, as I'm the editor of the Annual Index of Economic Freedom. Latvia has been one of the stars of the index, uh, improving its score by almost 17 points since 1996. And it's now ranked 32nd in economic freedom out of 180 countries worldwide. That's important because countries with more economic freedom tend to have higher incomes, better health. They do a better job protecting the environment. Well, joining us today to discuss all of these issues is the Prime Minister of Latvia, Grishianis Karens. Dr. Karens was actually born in the United States in Wilmington, Delaware. His parents left Latvia during World War II and the Soviet occupation. He was active in the American Latvian community throughout his youth and studied at St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland, and later at the University of Pennsylvania. He graduated there summa cum laude in 1988, and in 1996 earned a PhD in linguistics in the field of automatic speech recognition. He moved to Latvia in 1997, worked initially in business, and was elected to the Saima, uh, that's the parliament, in 2002, and he helped found the New Era Party. He served as Minister for Economics from 2004 to 2006. In 2009, he was elected to the European Parliament where he served almost 10 years. In 2018, he was elected as the chairman of the New Unity Party and became their candidate for the Latvian Premiership. After the elections and a long negotiation process, he was appointed prime minister in early, um, in January, 2019. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to the Heritage Foundation. We're honored by your presence and uh, the floor is yours. 
thank you very much. It's a wonderful introduction. It's wonderful to uh, be with all of you. Uh, what for you is this morning, uh, for me is uh, this evening, but uh, this being the north of Europe, the sun will shine uh, until about 10.30 or so uh, this evening. So uh, I understand that I have, um, uh, let's see, uh, 15 minutes or under to try to keep people's attention. I'll, I'll speak even less if I, if I can, uh, not easy for a politician. Uh, about Latvia uh, first, so just uh, to remind everyone, um, where we have been, say, in the past 100 years, uh, we have, uh, uh, after World War I, uh, we declared uh, our independence and then fought a, a two-year war of liberation, uh, interestingly, against both Germany and Russia, and very interesting for us, uh, we won on both accounts. Uh, we uh, developed a democracy, uh, along came World War II, uh, occupation, uh, incorporation into the Soviet Union. Uh, we regained our independence uh, in 1991 as the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, uh, not so long afterwards, in 2004, we joined both uh, the EU and NATO. So we're a member of both of these uh, clubs, you could say. Uh, we are a, uh, a very strong believer in transatlanticism. Uh, and we are very, very strong believers in international cooperation, open borders, and uh, free trade. Um, what about uh, recently? Uh, so COVID, uh, the COVID crisis uh, took the whole world uh, a, a little bit uh, off guard, uh, to say uh, the least. Uh, what did we do in our country? We reacted very quickly uh, and had wonderful cooperation from uh, society as a whole. Uh, and indeed, this crisis really helped to, to uh, bring people together. Uh, there, actually, the, the cooperation between the government and the population is, is maybe at, a, at, a, at, a, at an all-time post-re-independence high. Uh, and actually, people thinking the government is doing a good job makes me, of course, rather uh, happy. Uh, but it's, it's, it's more a tribute to uh, our, our own people than maybe to the government itself. Basically, what we did is we went down to two people and two meters before we had our first uh, casualty, our first fatality. No one had died yet. Some people had been infected. And we didn't go into lockdown, but we went into um, uh, 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 quite extreme social distancing. Uh, the result is that today uh, we have less than one person uh, falling ill per 100,000. Uh, and we have had only 30 people die from this disease. That's 15 for every million. That would be the equivalent of about 4,900 people in the U.S. I guess it's it's about 10 times less. Um, uh, uh, we're not out of the woods uh, by no stretch of the imagination, uh, but uh, the pandemic in our country is, is really not noticeable on the streets. We're not having currently people-to-people um, -people transmission the only few uh, cases that we're seeing are people coming in, and we do a very thorough job of testing, uh, tracing, and isolating all contacts to make sure that there's no further spread. Um, but here's the irony. Um, COVID did not have a very, um, to date, a devastating effect uh, in our country. We were able to manage that. But our economy, as a relatively small and completely open economy, um, went uh, down uh, almost as much as any other economy uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, it looks like we're going to be down by about six to seven percent uh, a fall in GDP this year. Um, uh, the worst hit uh, countries in terms of the uh, epidemic, uh, like Italy, uh, look to be looking for a little more uh, between eight and ten percent. But we're very close in terms of the of the effect. We, we call it an asymmetric uh, uh, health uh, effect, but a completely symmetrical uh, economic effect. We all go down regardless of whether people are actually ill in our country or not. Now, how are we uh, working to get out of this? Um, uh, the, the first thing is uh, uh, I need to say is that we uh, are borrowing money. We're able to do that on the capital markets. Uh, about six to s about almost seven percent of our GDP is being borrowed that we're investing into our economy. And the investments come in, in, in three flavors. So we have uh, all sorts of support schemes for furloughed workers, et cetera. 
Uh, we're investing a lot in infrastructure. What governments generally do, build a road, fix a bridge, um, get people to work, get the economy moving again. And we're putting a lot of money into what I would generally call modernization. So helping our companies become more competitive uh, Europe-wide and worldwide. Uh, and uh, there, uh, there's lots of investment going on. Now, that of course means our debt burden is increasing. Uh, we went into this crisis with about a 40% uh, debt to GDP ratio. We're going to be coming out of this crisis with about a 50% uh, debt to GDP ratio. Relative to many countries around the world, it's not um, an unsurmountable amount of debt, but it's quite a bit, bit of debt. Uh, so how are we planning to get out of that uh, is through a combination of reforms and growth. Uh, so we're not looking, um, I guess you could say we're looking to grow our way out of the debt uh, by growing our economy. And the reforms that we're enacting uh, are rather far-reaching reforms aimed at making the state more efficient. So we just passed uh, into law a, um, a, uh, a regional reform, cutting down the number of local municipalities from 110 down to 42. Um, why is that important? It means a better or a, a more efficient allocation of resources. And with the success of this reform, we're now continuing with the healthcare and educational reform also to make these systems um, uh, more economic, to have the service provided to the citizen uh, at a higher quality and at a less cost uh, cost per per you know unit served or however you want to uh, look at that. Now, to get out of this, uh, uh, it's not enough only for our country uh, to give in the effort. If I take the next uh, uh, step further, it's a European Union-wide effort, and we're in negotiation. The heads of the governments are currently in negotiation of putting together not only the next seven-year multi-annual financial framework, the seven-year um, EU fund program, uh, if you will, but we're also looking at putting together a recovery instrument, a recovery instrument which in Europe uh, will be, um, if, if, it, if, can, if it can be agreed, about 750 billion euros. That's quite a bit of money uh, uh, for the union as a whole uh, to put into our economies, but not only to oil the wheels, to have that go hand in hand with various reforms. Uh, but I'm convinced that we need to go a step further, uh, and that is that Europe uh, needs to expand its um, good trading relations with uh, similar blocks. And when I say similar blocks, there are two very obvious huge trading blocks in the world. One of them is called uh, the European Union, and the other one is called the United States. Uh, economies which are similar in, in scale. Uh, Europe has uh, more citizens. Uh, I think the US economy still has a little more money, but uh, uh, very comparable in terms of um, uh, size of economies. We're extremely comparable when it comes to terms of our fundamental beliefs. So freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. Um, democracy, when I was growing up, was something which was expanding. Uh, nowadays, unfortunately, it's contracting. So I'm convinced that like-minded countries and the country blocks uh, need to work together. Um, to look at it from a pragmatic point of view, someone is always going to set the rules of the game, the rules for world trade, the rules for um, how business and money flows. Uh, since the end of the Second World War, there was uh, 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 the U.S. Uh, was as the as the overriding, the large uh, economic power was pretty much able to set these. The world has become a little more decentralized today. Uh, but uh, the US and the EU as a combined, uh, uh, shall we say, a democratic force has a fantastic potential to make sure that the rules of free and open trade hold in the world. Because not every country, not every economy is interested in free and open trade. Uh, and and uh, uh, the, the bloc, I call it the bloc, uh, you call it a country, the United States, but it, it works similarly uh, to the bloc of nations called the European Union. Uh, this is e extremely important. So from the US side, uh, the Three Seas Initiative uh, is something that our country uh, is, uh, is committed to. We've committed uh, a certain amount of money uh, into uh, uh, making that initiative uh, work uh, from our side. 
Uh, this, I think, is a great uh, European-US uh, collaborative uh, uh, project. But of course, that, that it really touches that which is broadly referred to uh, Eastern Europe. Those, that's where the, the three Cs are. Uh, I think um, that uh, an EU-US trade deal should never be given up. And uh, we have to continue thinking about how we could get that to work and working on uh, common technologies. Uh, so for example, 5G, um, 5G is, is, a, is a developing uh, technology uh, where I think, again, the U.S. and the European Union have a lot of room uh, to work together and we should be doing that. So um, I guess I'll sum up my opening remarks and I'd gladly respond to any questions. Uh, we've had a hell of a tough history. Uh, we've learned in our tough history as Latvians that uh, the way uh, to move forward is not to isolate but to engage with others not to close your borders, but to open your borders to trade and investment. Uh, we have, I think, a fantastic environment in which to invest. It's actually a very safe environment in terms of COVID right now as well. Uh, and we're looking to expand that through strong partnerships with uh, Europe and the US. And uh, as a final note, given that I'm speaking with an American audience, I'd like to remind everyone that in terms of our commitment to our own defense, we are spending the 2% of our GDP, and it looks like in 2021, we'll be overstepping the 2% because as our GDP, unfortunately, be uh, shrinking a little bit because of the COVID effect, we are not looking to cut back on defense spending. So our defense spending as a proportion of our GDP should be growing. Uh, we invest uh, 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 in our defense. Uh, we're very active in, co in, in collaborative cooperation. And one of the big uh, importances of, of the uh, uh, Latvian relation uh, with the US uh, is, of course, a geostrategical one. Uh, our neighbor to the east from time immemorial has been Russia. Uh, Russia is a whole other issue that I'd gladly speak to anyone about. But uh, we understand full well the neighborhood that we live in. I think we have a lot to teach in terms of disinformation, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, it's the multilateral and transatlantic cooperation, which is extremely important. Like-minded countries need to stick together. Those of us that believe in freedom, democracy, and the rule of law, the European Union and the United States. So ambassador, I'd be happy to, uh, uh, to respond to any questions. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for those uh, remarks. Uh, there was a lot of uh, substance there that gives us uh, plenty to talk about at this point. Um, you mentioned the great, um, really, um, by world standards, outstanding uh, response in Latvia to COVID-19. I, I understand that you yourself were quarantined uh, at the beginning of the crisis. Uh, so uh, that's, that's uh, I think, a wonderful example of uh, taking personal responsibility. Um, I have a, a question uh, that came from our um, um, the Office of Representative Adderholt, who's one of our Congress people in Alabama, uh, in the United States, uh, talking about your economic response to the crisis. Um, and of course, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Latvia had a very low a public debt burden uh, at the beginning of this. And in fact, we show that in our index of economic freedom, where uh, you're one of the very top performers in fiscal health. Uh, but the question from Gregor Cato is, um, what plan does your country have to cope with the increase in debt? Uh, you talked about trying to promote growth, but that's not always the easiest thing for our uh, countries. And he also asked, does this require multilateral cooperation in any way? Uh, thank you very much for the question. I think it's a great question. Uh, so uh, the second part, does it require multilateral cooperation? Uh, yes, uh, it does require it. We cannot do it uh, by ourselves any more than Germany can do it by ourselves. So I would argue the U.S. can do it uh, uh, by themselves. We all need each other. Uh, to keep those uh, borders open and investments flowing back and forth. Now, in terms of uh, what, what we will be doing is two things. So we have a plan that uh, over the next eight years, we will be reducing our debt from 50 back down to 40%. Uh, so uh, that which we're borrowing now, we have, we have already an eight-year plan, how we, how we will be reducing that. And one is uh, we are 
traditionally, uh, it's like a country of fiscalists. Uh, uh, you know, in, in Latvian, there's a saying that debt is not a brother. Um, and I think it sort of holds through uh, in our society. Uh, we understand the need for to borrow money to grow, uh, but at the same time, uh, we understand that to live off of borrowed money is uh, is it, it doesn't lead to a good either for an individual, a family, a company, or a country for that matter. Uh, and through the reforms that we're doing, we're looking to attract more investment and to grow our economy. And uh, you know, prior to COVID coming on. Uh, our economy was uh, growing. It was growing at a slower pace. Uh, we had been um, a four or five percent growth. We had slowed to about a two percent growth, but it was still growth. That was uh, uh, sort of the general uh, European trends were rather susceptible to uh, external market uh, strengths or weaknesses. But uh, this is a big part of it. And also remember, a country such as ours, we still are net beneficiaries of EU funds. Uh, so we get. Um, roughly the equivalent of, uh, uh, well, it's, it's uh, every seven years we get about a one year's uh, budget worth of monies. Uh, it's, it's a little less now because our economy has grown considerably. But uh, we're looking also to take that money, uh, most, of, most of which comes in the form of grants, so we don't have to pay it back, and also invest it into our infrastructure, into our companies to make us more competitive. And when you travel around our country, when you, you know, I've been a politician now for 15 uh, more years, it's getting embarrassing. Uh, I've been around a little bit as a politician and uh, I remember traveling around uh, in the early 2000s, what companies looked like. And some of those same companies which are, are working today, they're automated uh, companies and now exporting know-how. Our companies are expanding into neighboring economies. Uh, so we are uh, now no longer someone sort of being invested into. We are already an outward investor. We need more, uh, but this is our overall plan. Well, thank you for that. Um, I was very interested when you talked about the two great trading blocks, the European Union and uh, the United States. I, I've often talked about the United States as the first continent-wide free trade area. Um, and I think um, not everyone appreciates the extent to which that particular uh, policy decision uh, to open our continent is responsible for the prosperity we've enjoyed in the United States. Um, the prospects for a free trade agreement between the European Union and the United States are, um, well, perhaps not so good at this point, and yet there are active negotiations underway. I, I wonder if you could comment a little bit on that. Well, um, you learn over time to sort of take a longer view picture of things, especially being a Latvian, uh, taking a short term view doesn't get you anywhere. You really have to play the long game. Uh, and I think uh, ultimately it is in the interest of the US, just as it is in the interest of the European Union to find, uh, 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 to, to have a, a, a bilateral uh, trade agreement. Uh, this is good for the US's business, it's good for our business. And of course, as in any such agreement, there, there are many thorny issues. Agriculture is always, I mean, within the EU, agriculture is a very thorny issue between member states. Uh, it's very emotional. Um, there's, there's lots of heavy, heavy lobby activity as well. But uh, it is in both of our interests uh, to do this because I mean, you know, people speak we're in the euro, our currency is euro, we're in the euro zone. No one speaks of a dollar zone, but you effectively have that. You have the advantage of having a federal government and a federal treasury, which we don't have in Europe. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of a, a lot of the way that things work, uh, there are similarities. Uh, I think that the European Union has a lot to do in terms of taking down internal borders. So. We have free movement of people and free movement of goods. Uh, that works quite well. During COVID, we had a lot of borders going up, but, but they've been taken down as the uh, health situation changed and, and uh, goods continued to flow even when people were not moving. Uh, so that, that was never uh, an issue. But we still had the issue of services moving uh, uh, around uh, Europe. So for a Latvian company to export its services, either in construction or anything else, there are shall we say, rather um, some peculiar ways to uh, 
be a little protectionist around Europe. And we have to overcome those borders. Similarly, in the digital sphere, uh, there's lots of room for growth within the European Union, taking down the borders to digital growth. And th these are barriers that the US doesn't have. But as we take down our internal borders, uh, this is a, a, an ongoing process. I think it's important to get those borders down between the EU as a whole and the US. And again, uh, I only see long-term benefits to this. There are benefits of trade, uh, uh, that's obvious, but there are also uh, uh, good benefits in terms of uh, security and securing the role, uh, the, the role and the rule of democracy around the world. Because um, let's face it, if the EU and the US cannot cooperate closely, what are the other big players in the world? Well, maybe they're not quite so democratic uh, as we are. Maybe they're not quite so open to free trade, to bilaterally uh, uh, working free trade. So I think it's always important to remember what the alternatives are. Um, no one block is big enough to go it alone. Uh, that's the boldest I would say today. Neither the European Union nor um, the United States. It is the need to cooperate. Uh, well, I can't think of anyone better than yourself with your personal history to uh, help move that cooperation between the United States and, and Europe along. Um, let's turn to your neighbor uh, to the east. Um, I have a submitted question from um, a man named Christian Orr, who's with a company called Cortec. And his question is, given Putin's penchant for so-called non-kinetic warfare, how do you foresee Russia undermining um, economic recovery efforts? Uh, that's, uh, I like the term non-kinetic warfare. Um, I guess Russia also engages in some kinetic activities in Ukraine, but there's a lot of um, right. non-physical. But uh, let, let's put it this way. In Latvia, we are on the front line of NATO, you could say. Uh, we are right next uh, to Russia, and we know on a daily basis what disinformation, uh, um, organized disinformation, uh, what it looks like, what it feels like, you know, smells and tastes. It's, uh, we, know, we know a lot about that. We, we have in Riga uh, uh, the NATO uh, uh, center of, uh, uh, it's a STRATCOM COE, so the Center of Excellence in the Strategic Communication um, Research, uh, where there's a big uh, collaborative effort among very many NATO uh, countries uh, working here out of Riga. And this is an obvious place to do it because we have a lot of built up or uh, accrued uh, in-house expertise. But Russia is not um, looking to undermine uh, our economies. Actually, it doesn't have a lot of um, leverage to undermine uh, the economies of, 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 of Europe or, or, or the US. But what it does have and what its main goal seems to be is to undermine um, uh, uh, societal cohesiveness. So mm -hmm. Russia is in the mischievous game of uh, not bringing people together, but driving people apart. And they seem to be indiscriminate um, sort of what position they'll take. They'll look for, uh, a Terry, uh, some distinction or some difference that the two of us will have. And it, it doesn't matter which side they believe in, if or any side, the, the main goal is to drive us apart, to foster uh, malcontent. And of course, indirectly, that, that affects economies because when people start to um, um, you know, disbelieve their governments or, or fight one another, they're not focusing on ep economic growth, then there's, they're starting to focus more on societal issues. Uh, and uh, you know, the issues are a dime a dozen, they're different in, in, in various countries throughout Europe, they're different in the US, they're different in different parts of the US. But the hallmark is, look at two people who are yelling at one another, and boy, that's just what the Kremlin needs. You just put a little kindling in one fire, put a little kindling in the other fire, you don't even have to know what the issue is. Just stoke and stoke, and stoke both sides at once. Uh, there's no distinction between left and right, uh, it's, it's to sell discord. That's what they're in the business of doing. And if you read their, their, their public uh, military doctrine, their military doctrine is to have weak neighbors. Uh, they want to have weak neighbors because they have a belief that they are being attacked all the time. Well, it, you have to understand and read some Russian history to understand where that thinking can come from. But 
that this is the big difference between say a country that, such as ours or generally democracies democracies always always want strong healthy and wealthy neighbors because if your neighbor is healthy and wealthy he will not only not attack you he will trade with you and you will become more wealthy uh, so our interest is to have a strong and wealthy and democratic russia next to us unfortunately that's really not up to us but uh, th there's a lot of mischief going on. Um, but I don't think it's, uh, I, I don't see it directly in the field of, of, of economics or, or business, uh, but it is in the field of disinformation and with the social media playing the role that it plays today, especially during the COVID crisis, right? I mean, I, I was, as you said, I was in lockdown for two weeks. Uh, I was at a meeting where there was a, someone was COVID positive, nine of, of 13 government ministers were at that meeting. So we immediately went to online uh, work. Our parliament now works online. Uh, we have developed these fantastic tools where um, because of COVID, we just went light years ahead in terms of what we can do electronically. There's basically, I don't have to sign a single document in, anymore. I do it all electronically with an ID card and codes and et cetera, et cetera, that positively identifies me. But getting back to Russia, they're looking to drive um, societies apart and especially democratic societies. And our goal is to not let them do that. Do you, uh, can I just follow up on that? Because uh, this is obviously a very severe problem in the United States right now. And we've had Russian interference uh, um, in our electoral process in, in a very divisive way. And are there, and you've, you have long experience uh, with this, of course, between your uh, Latvian and Russian uh, citizens uh, or citizens of Russian heritage. Um, are there some specific uh, kind of tactics or programs or policies that you think can help counter this um, divisiveness when, um, at a time when people aren't even sure about the factual information they're getting from the media, um, it's very difficult for us to um, become cohesive around even a specific set of, of facts, uh, much less a set of policies. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, the, the short answer is actually one that doesn't make you very happy. Uh, it's through education. Uh, mm. Our societies, I think, in the West are facing a little bit of a crisis uh, that we're seeing that there is a, a growing gap between people with various degrees of education. It has to do with computer literacy. It has to do with critical thinking, um, evaluating sources, you know, who is telling you this and can you put that in some sort of context? So if, if I'm looking at a health issue, you know, would, would I be interested that that person actually has a degree in medicine or is a medical researcher or is not? I mean, and I, I think to us here, it seems obvious that you would want a doctor consulting you, but it's unfortunately not so obvious to everyone in our societies. And uh, the best way to counter disinformation is through education. Uh, and that, of course, takes time, investment and a very concerted effort from the government. But in terms of our own uh, society here in Latvia, so we have the the... Latvian speakers that you know who, who speak Latvian at home and and the non-Latvian speakers who mostly speak Russian at home, but they're various ethnicities. It's sort of from the uh, the Soviet times they were coming from all over the Soviet Union, but what they had in common was the Russian language. Um, but over time, we're seeing these differences diminish, and especially during COVID, which came to my great, uh, I, I was really happy about that. That you see, you saw that our society coalesced around the need to support and work with one another. And uh, we found, and interestingly, we found that the historic difference between, say, native Russian speakers' dislike of the government, the difference between what language you spoke um, washed away, and both uh, parts of society had equal support uh, for the government. Because it, it wasn't necessarily, as I say, you know, I'm the head of the government, so I can say it's support for me. No, 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 don't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say that. But uh, it was people coming together and feeling that neighborliness and realizing that those things which make us different amount to really nothing in, in the face of something serious like a pandemic. And so it, it sometimes is a crisis that brings societies together or they can bring societies apart, which we're seeing uh, you know, in, in some parts of the world. And, and we've been fortunate, I guess, in that regard. But in terms of countering disinformation, uh, 
uh, um, education is is the best way, and it starts at, it at home and then in the schools. But it also has to do with um, um, uh, you know having a, making sure that uh, countries have um, a vibrant and reliable press that people people can believe. And uh, uh, in our country, uh, thankfully, we have a good part of the press that people actually have a good belief in. And in my view, they're actually quite objective. They unfortunately criticize me far more than I would like. Uh, but you know that that that's their job. And uh, sometimes uh, they they agree with me. So you know those days I'm happy. But uh, on the whole, I could say actually we have a very balanced uh, media in our country. And and. For our government, it's extremely important to make sure it stays that way. Uh, thank you. Um, I, now, if we could turn to your, um, not exactly neighbor, but a country even further to the east, China. Um, there are a couple of questions submitted about China, and perhaps I'll combine them together. and. And I uh, just ask you, you referred earlier to the development of digital technologies and the need to create that infrastructure in Europe. And um, particularly in the area of 5G, this is a, an area where China has a, a lot of capability and has uh, made a significant investment in trying to promote its technologies and its companies around the world. And um, I think we know that that comes with certain vulnerabilities and has raised some concern, certainly in the United States, but also in Europe and many other places around the world. And um, one of the uh, suggestions that um, my colleagues and I made in our recent paper was that we um, work very closely together uh, between Europe and the United States to try to uh, make sure that we can have secure 5G technology in which we can all have confidence. and. Um, not be worried about um, some other foreign government that doesn't necessarily share our values and what they will do with the information they might have access to. So um, I, I just wondered if you could comment on this a little. Uh, sure, that's a, a, a very interesting and, and a very timely uh, topic that you touch upon, China. Um, first, I'd like to say I think there's a difficulty in terms of reciprocity. Uh, so. Um, Chinese companies are competing uh, throughout Europe. Um, certainly, uh, uh, we have a, an open economy, um, but uh, it's not the it's not the same truth that European uh, companies have equal access to the Chinese market. Um, we look at state aid in Europe. We have very very strict state aid rules, um, limiting the amount that governments can intervene in any market to support any you know company, even if it's a favorite company or uh, uh, whatever, uh, Chinese uh, uh, support seems, shall we say, a little different in that regard with uh, different uh, concerns. In Europe, we have very high uh, health, safety and environmental standards that cost money. Uh, China doesn't necessarily have these same um, high standards, which means that they have lower production costs, but the produced goods flood into Europe anyway. What has COVID shown us? COVID has shown us a vulnerability uh, in the West, uh, I think also among NATO countries. Uh, let's take what, what I faced in my own country and what uh, everyone has faced uh, in the beginning of the crisis, um, personal protective equipment, the PPEs. Um, all hospitals have PPEs, but no hospital anywhere in the world stacks you know, for a pandemic. You don't know what kind of pandemic, you know, you can't, stack everything so then you need to purchase um in europe uh all production was um you know uh immediately full i mean there, there was there was no spare capacity there were no there's no leftovers in the warehouses we ended up as most of my uh, uh colleagues in europe we had to go to china to purchase personal protective equipment because we have a lack of production capacity in europe um that is a big vulnerability now, so a face mask is one order of complexity. Now let's take it to the next one. Let's go to 5G. We're talking about, you know, the uh, the technology uh, in our in our phones, in our in uh, you know, in our computers, which has that element of information, of data, and data. That's where the money is. Um, 
boy, you really actually want to be certain if you're concerned, and I am concerned that we don't have enough local capacity to produce face masks, actually might be now we have a, a, a quite increased capacity to produce face masks, by the way. But if we're going to address that issue, I think that technology issue really needs to be addressed. And the 5G, I think it's a very serious uh, question, uh, how we could in Europe with the US co cooperate more uh, to make sure that we have, how should we say, homegrown uh, technology that can compete on the world market. Because there is that element of data security, uh, it's uh, uh, extremely important. Um, in the healthcare system, which is uh, with 5G technology, you have new opportunities for healthcare and new opportunities for someone to, to uh, sneak, snoop into the health of a society. We have um, a gene technology, which is advancing in gene databases. Oh, that database is quite interesting to, uh, uh, to various players who, who are interested in maybe less than um, noble, noble causes. Uh, so I think it's very important that we address China, um, you know, there, there are great benefits to trade with China, but I think it's important to have reciprocity in that trade uh, agreement and also to think about what kinds of things we uh, say in the NATO alliance would want to make sure that we are self-sufficient uh, if push comes to shove. And a pandemic is, is one such instance, a national catastrophe, a, a natural, natural uh, catastrophe uh, could be a, a, another such instance, or for example, that which you don't want to have a, 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 a catastrophe is um, uh, information uh, going uh, south, so to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're getting close to the end of the program, Prime Minister, but there's uh, one more question that was just submitted. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I can't see the name of the presenter, but uh, it's a good question, and I, I think I'll ask it. Uh, um, certainly, we in the United States appreciate the strong support that Latvia has shown for NATO um, since becoming a member. And uh, the, the question really asks, uh, with all these things we've been talking about, Russia, China, whatever, um, is the role of NATO changing? How would you see uh, NATO evolving in the, in the years ahead? Uh, well, uh, certainly I didn't believe when people were saying that NATO is obsolete. Uh, I never thought that. And NATO is finding its footing again, uh, which I think is very positive. Uh, in NATO, we, we all have the uh, commitment by, I've forgotten what year, uh, it's still a couple of years away, where we all said we will meet the 2% of GDP. Um, we've already met that. Uh, other EU countries that have been uh, further behind the curve are actually moving up. Uh, so it's a question of taking on uh, its own responsibility. And uh, I think what, what needs to be changed uh, in a positive way, what can change, is that in Europe, um, there's a growing realization that we have to uh, take on more of uh, the responsibility, the ownership of this fantastic alliance. Uh, so after the Second World War, it was the United States which provided uh, for Western Europe a... Um, military uh, uh, safety umbrella, you know, the, the, the nuclear umbrella, the, the troops on the ground. Um, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, a, a lot has changed, but unfortunately the world hasn't become a, a, a safer or a nicer place in, in uh, you know, all around. Uh, we still have um, uh, uh, notable different difficulties with, with Russia. We have a, a growing China, which is um, you know, in, in the past couple of months, uh, there have been various instances where China is showing um, more, uh, shall we say, a robust, uh, it to not say necessarily aggressive uh, outward stance. Uh, and uh, this, this is a concern to us. And I think that we in the alliance uh, need to realize that. Uh, we need to continue uh, to invest into this alliance. And a big part of where I think uh, NATO needs to expand is that NATO is very good militarily, um, but where there's lots of room for growth is, is in the, uh, the hybrid warfare scenarios, the disinformation, the cyber uh, scenarios. And there, I think that uh, in Europe, we have uh, lots of expertise and know-how where we can uh, advance uh, also this side of NATO because the adversary is not um, necessarily 
you know, these days a front line with a ditch and a, and a fence uh, uh, in between. You know, North and South Korea is, is more the exception than the rule in the world these days, a, a clear line of demarcation. We have national boundaries, but we have difficulties occurring far behind any national boundary and damage which is being done uh, through subversive uh, uh, means, not necessarily military means. So we need to keep the robust uh, military stance as a definite deterrent. We do a lot of that. We have a, a plan of total defense, of territorial defense. Um, we have some, I think, very clever tactics Basically, we want to make sure that we're going to be the biggest pain in the ass of anyone who thinks of touching our territory, and we're developing our uh, capacity in, in this regard. But there's another aspect, which is not only the muscle and the brains to use the muscle cleverly. Uh, it is uh, dealing with the hybrid element, and I think here NATO has a lot of room for growth, and there is a great room uh, that's, that actually will have a big stimulus on economies because there's lots of room for growth also, of course, in the civilian uh, uh, application of, of, of all of these tools. So um, I think that we have a, a great future uh, together, the EU, uh, the US, also NATO. Um, we have a lot of work to do. And I think one of the big things that we need to do is to sort of get all back onto the page. Uh, we've sort of, it's like the hymnal, right? Uh, 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 someone dropped it, someone got it, uh, you know, turns the wrong page, someone is a little tone deaf and, and someone is singing and someone is still talking. Um, you know, we need to get back to the same page, tune into the, uh, you know, to the organ and uh, sort of get back to singing a similar tune. Uh, we're a little out of sync. Um, it's not surprising, a lot has happened and there are many uh, uh, objective reasons for that, but we can get there, but we have to realize that we're a little off, why we're a little off, and to get fully back on board. NATO is not obsolete. It is in our and in your future. Well, thank you very much for that answer. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, I, I think we're just about out of time. What I take from your remarks in this discussion is, uh, is a clear understanding of the, of the values that we share and the interests that we share. Uh, between Latvia and the United States. And um, I think that gives um, a great scope and great promise for um, our two countries working together uh, to solve the problems that we face in the future. Um, I'd like to give you now the opportunity to uh, just make some closing remarks if you'd like to. Okay, thank you very much. As a politician, I cannot let that opportunity slip by. I'd first of all like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you, to speak with all of you, and Ambassador, especially with you, um, wonderful questions. You're a, a, a great moderator. Um, my, my hat off to that. Um, and uh, I guess I'd like to sum off as a reminder uh, to our US friends, our American friends, uh, you have lots and lots of uh, good friends and strong allies in Europe. Uh, and we in the East of Europe, those of us who are closest uh, to Russia uh, uh, are, I think, in many ways, especially good friends. Uh, uh, we share the same uh, basic values, so freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. Uh, we have one hell of a tough history, all of us combined, where we know what it is uh, to lose uh, any one of those. In our cases, all of them. We lost freedom. We lost democracy, and we certainly did not have the rule of law. We had the rule of thuggery uh, during the Soviet occupation. Uh, we have regained those. So once values lost are regained, they are held ever more dearly. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I certainly hope uh, for a continued strong and good transatlantic dialogue. Uh, it's important. It's, it's one of those traditional everyone looks for it, win-win situations. It's good for the European Union, it's certainly good for Latvia, but it is definitely good for the United States as well. And I wish us all sort of Godspeed in, in pursuing our combined and our shared goals. Thank you, Prime Minister. And uh, now I think we'll go back to Cherise. Wow, that was really great. Thank you both. Thank you, Prime Minister Karens and Ambassador Miller for your comments today and the work you do every day helping to lead and shape the conversation internationally and for us at Heritage. Thank you to the audience for joining us and for all of your questions. 
please feel free to email me, sharice.trump at heritage.org with any additional questions you may have for our experts. And finally, please complete a brief survey that will appear on your screen at the conclusion of the program. You can also visit heritage.org for these recordings and upcoming programs. I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day.